Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Our guest today is a global leader who requires no introduction. His name, his face, and his achievements are recognized all over the world. As a result, there is not much that I need to say other than to welcome him, thank him for being with us, and invite him to the podium. But please allow me to say a few instructive and meaningful things about him. He worked his way through the UK Parliament representing the Labour Party as a member, then as its leader, and finally uh, to the 1997 victory which made him the Prime Minister ending an 18-year-old, 19-year uh, Conservative Party's hold on power. In his three years, in his three terms and a decade, as a prime minister, he played a profound role in pressing the White House to put profound pr pressure to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and to put it on top of the agenda. Even while its focus was still on Iraq, he steadfastly tried. He became a global leader whose stature and luster were not diminished by his departure from office. I have read his book, Tony Blair, A Journey. And I would recommend it effusively to every person interested in politics. Based on this book, and having spoken to people who know him intimately, and having observed his rise and rise, I am tempted to express a few things about him. He's someone who wanted to make the United Kingdom and then the world a better place. He led a party that he thought was going down the wrong path and steered it first to power and then to govern and bring about change. He understood the critical need to define policy and had the skills to manage the politics to implement it. His mastery of communications made him a target to charges of spin by his political opponents, who failed to understand his genuine commitment to policy. His formidable ability to focus on one issue, one issue, to grip it, as he says, to prioritize and to act has made him the transformative prime minister that he has been. Since leaving office at Downing Street, he brought his unique combination of talents and skills to the world arena where he's been at the forefront of attacking the largest issues of our times. He has become the quartet representative to the Middle East. While doing that, he also established the Africa Governance Initiative, the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, the Tony Blair Sports Foundation, and he also leads the Breaking the Climate Deadlock Initiative. It's hard to imagine any other person to, on earth who would have the energy to engage in this, in this range of issues and to grasp their complexities as he delivers solutions and results. Yet I know that he spends most of his time focusing on the Middle East, which is his real passion, where he applies ceaseless effort to help the Palestinians build their institutions, their economy, in preparation for the inevitable state. This audience is interested, interested in hearing from Mr. Blair about the Middle East, and in particular about the work of the Quartet in Palestine, about his views on the political implications of the institution and state building program, and how he thinks we can seriously reach a final peace agreement. Who and when will someone grip this issue to deliver the Palestine-Israel version of the Good Friday that you delivered in Ireland? That's our question. We are also interested in hearing your views, Mr. Blair, about religion and conflict, as well as the issue of international intervention in which you played a pivotal role. Mr. Blair will deliver his remarks uh, momentarily, and he has graciously, graciously accepted to take questions. We have cards for you, and we please uh, ask you to raise your hand with the cards as you are ready uh, for our people to collect those cards. Mr. Blair's remarks are on record. However, the question and answer period is off the record. Please help me welcome the Right Honorable Mr. Blair. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Thank you for that, um, that plug of my book, <laughs> which is uh, uh, most gracious of you. Um, thank you to the American Task Force on Palestine for giving me the opportunity to to discuss these issues uh, with you and 
Um, you know, since leaving office, uh, to be involved in the Middle East and religious interfaith and breaking the deadlock on climate change, it's a slightly tough agenda, frankly. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the things I, I learned in the, it was actually uh, 18 years, not 19 years of opposition, um, and we counted every year, so we remember, um, uh, a bit like uh, I, I, I guess you guys do. Um, you know, one of the things I learned was, was that you, you've always got to, to keep yourself focused on the possibility of eventual success. Um, uh, sometimes it seemed a little distant, I must say, about uh, it, during those long years of, of, of opposition. I always remember we, we, we'd, um, after we lost our fourth election in a row, um, I met one of my party activists who, who said to me, uh, the people have now voted against us four times. What's wrong with them? Uh, <laughs> which, um, <laughs> And it gave his own explanation, maybe, as to why he's so long in opposition. So what is also necessary whenever you're faced with a challenge is to um, reconsider, recalibrate thinking as well. Look, let me explain to you, first of all, um, how I see this situation and explain perhaps also a little bit about what I actually do uh, there. Since I am um, out in Israel and Palestine two or sometimes even three times a, a, a month, um, I spend a lot of time um, going on the West Bank, not so much for obvious reasons in Gaza, though I, I, I have been there. Um, and I spend a lot of time um, talking to um, the leaders of, the, um, of, of, of um, both the Israelis and the Palestinians. But I also, basically, our work um, for the Quartet, which as you know is this rather extraordinary uh, body, um, which whenever I'm asked to explain, I say, well, my my political masters are, are the, the coalition between the Russia, Russia, the United Nations, the European Union, and the United States of America. And people say, what, they all agree? Uh, and I suppose well, not quite like that. So um, the work that I do is very much uh, on the ground in respect to the economy, in respect of building capacity, and supporting um, the state building exercise of Prime Minister Fayyad. That is my, my principal role. Of course, uh, you get involved in the politics necessarily, um, and frankly, everything um, to do with this situation is intensely political. Just to give you one other um, uh, important piece of information about my own beliefs in, in relation to this, I am and always have been um, an advocate of Palestinian statehood. I don't think there is any solution that I can envisage to this issue uh, that does not involve an independent, sovereign Palestinian state. Um, I've always believed that, uh, and I believe that still. And when people sometimes say to me, as they do, and by the way, people on both sides occasionally, they say, yeah, the two-state solution, you know, come on. Um, I say, what's the alternative? Because the one-state solution, uh, I can't quite see it myself in anything that remotely resembles peace. So I am, always have been, and always will be an advocate for that solution. Why is it, though, that if I'm not going to do this um, for the purposes of, of, of help and support for the process, but why is it that if I said to you, right, hands up those people in the room that believe we're going to get a Palestinian state in the next year, um, I might not get a full show of hands, right? Why is it, and this is where I think we have to analyze what has happened in the past few years, and then try not to chart a different purpose, but somewhat of a different strategy to achieve that purpose. And the reason I think is, is very simple, and it, I'd like to start it really from the year 2000. In the year 2000, there was the attempt, uh, courageously led by President Clinton, to bring about an agreement. It didn't succeed. And each side has its narrative as to why it didn't. Afterwards came the Intifada, and each side has its narrative as to what happened and, and why that happened. And then we also had the disengagement from Gaza, and each side again has its narrative about what happened there. And then we had 
in 2007, the takeover by Hamas of Gaza, and well, many sides have their narrative about what happened there. And what this really did was it gave the process um, a fundamental credibility gap on both sides, which meant that even at the same time as people said, yes, we fully accept and, and believe that the two-state solution is the right solution, but tell me how it's going to be achieved. For the Palestinian side, the weight of occupation increased. For the Israeli side, they believed that they were then dealing with a split Palestinian politics and a, an existential security challenge. So we actually reflect this credibility issue in the way we now talk about the two-state solution. Because if you listen carefully to how most of us talk about it, we talk now about a secure state of Israel and a viable state of Palestine. And those adjectives reflect that credibility gap, that question that people have in their minds as to whether, if you're an Israeli, you will get not a state of Israel, a secure state of Israel, and a question in the mind of the Palestinians that, yes, it's all very well to talk about a Palestinian state, but that state's also got to be a viable state. And that's the issue now, which really brings me to the core point, which is how in these circumstances, when it's not simply possible to recapture and retake where we were in the year 2000 and say, right, let's just let's erase the memory of what's happened in those previous years and just retake from where we left off in the year 2000. It's not possible to do that because what has actually changed in the meantime is a series of things that impinge directly, not just on credibility in theory, but the practicality of statehood. So in my judgment, we are in a position where the core challenge now is to rebuild the credibility of the process, to rebuild trust that such a process will lead to an outcome of a secure state of Israel and a viable state of Palestine. And the key to doing that, in my judgment, again, is not just a political negotiation described as top-down, but also a state-building exercise ground up that gives people a sense that there is not a negotiation carrying on disconnected from the reality of people's lives. So my strategy for this is to change lives, which changes minds, and to combine that political negotiation with a ground up state building exercise that gives the Palestinian people the belief that statehood is going to be the eventual evolution of this process of state building and gives Israel the sense that a state of Palestine will be well governed, properly run, and a secure and stable partner. Now, the work therefore that we do um, in, in my office and the work that we do in conjunction with Senator Mitchell and with uh, the State Department and the other partners in the quartet is to focus first on supporting Salam Fayyad and the state building exercise. What does that mean? It means, for example, in the rule of law, there has been immense progress, both in training security forces for the Palestinians, deploying them, building a civil police, the rule of law, courts, prisons, prosecutors, all those things that go up to make critical statehood. Prime Minister Fayyad has also introduced a whole new set of rules in relation to business, in relation to Palestinian finances, in relation to the integrity of the Palestinian system. And that state building exercise has been supported by a commitment that we helped organize at the Paris conference in December 2007, which resulted in a big commitment of money to the Palestinian Authority. And look, I used to sit through as Prime Minister many pledging conferences. Um, and frankly, you know, you got a lot more pledged than you actually ever really received. But in this instance, actually there has been real support given to that Palestinian Authority state building program. 
In addition to that, though there is an immense way to go, we have been focusing on removing or opening core checkpoints and access and movement points, on issues to do with the extending the Palestinian security presence. There are proposals for the building, as you will know, of a new city, Rawabi, other proposals for extending um, the ability of Palestinians to develop, not just Area A, but in Area B and Area C as well, to improve lives in East Jerusalem, to build the possibility of a genuine base for tourism, which of course in Palestine is a huge unexploited asset in respect of crossings and even in respect of Gaza where we have been working not just to make sure that we get humanitarian provision into Gaza, but also, and critically, for reconstruction, for water, for sanitation, for ele electricity, and so on. And the purpose of all of this, in respect of which, before you say it, I will say it, there is a huge way to go still. But the purpose of all of this is to build capacity to run a state on the West Bank, where the Palestinian Authority are in charge, to give people the sense that there is actually genuine movement that it is possible to have that improves people's lives, and in respect of Gaza, to get to the point where we leave to the side what in my view is a mistaken view, which is that if Gaza is isolated, somehow Hamas is weakened, in my view, it is absolutely clear, improving the lives of people in Gaza improve the prospects of peace. So if we, if we are able to do this, then in my view, we will build support for that political negotiation. Now, you only have to state how much we have to do to realize how far we have to go. But I ask you just for a moment to imagine that we were able to get those improvements in people's lives that we were able to add to the agenda, not merely the traditional things that we talk about on access and movement, but actually improving lives in East Jerusalem, in Area C and so on. If we were able to get those changes that we're looking for in Gaza, and we were able to do that in support of a political negotiation, then I think the difference would be fundamental and considerable, not just in terms of people's lives, but in terms of the credibility of the process. So in my view, that is the challenge right at this present time. In other words, if all we do is simply have a conventional political negotiation, then I think we will continue to go round in circles rather than, than give clear, demonstrable support to the state building exercise that the Palestinians are engaged in that actually answers the security issue of the Israelis, but at the same time builds the capacity both economically and in security terms and politically for Palestinian statehood. A word about the negotiation. That negotiation, in my view, has to be conducted in a reasonably confidential and guided way. In other words, it won't be enough, and I learned this during the course of Northern Ireland. I can tell you that in all the meetings we had in Northern Ireland, very rarely did we make huge progress on core difficult issues by everyone sitting in a formal meeting around the table. But we did make an immense amount of progress when we were able to have confidential, clear discussions, often over a period of time, often in circumstances where there weren't note takers and scribblers around noting everything down, but where you could get to the point where people felt confident enough to start moving their positions. We learned one other thing in the Northern Ireland process that myself and Senator Mitchell were both engaged in, and that is the importance of not giving up. You know, I know the skepticism there is about whether it's possible to get this deal and to make this change. And you wouldn't have to be out in that region for a millisecond 
not to feel that skepticism. And, you know, I, I, I find it even when I'm back in my own home country. You know, people kind of say, well, what are you doing now then? I say, oh, I'm helping in the Middle East peace process. And they go, oh, good luck. <laughs> like, you know, what do you want to go and do that for? So I know and I feel that skepticism. I just want to say to you, though, that throughout the whole of the course of the Norland Island process, we had exactly the same skepticism. But actually, in the end, we managed to do it. And we managed to do it partly because we didn't give up. But we managed to do it for another reason. And this is a reason that has its own echo in something happening in the Middle East now. We, in the end, were able to create peace in Northern Ireland for many reasons, but one of the reasons we did it was because actually the circumstances outside changed. The Irish people were part of the European Union as Britain was part of the European Union. We wanted to get a cooperative relationship together. America was willing to play a part in bringing the sides together. Suddenly what seemed to be absolutely irreducible and irreversible as a source of conflict, people then said, look, we're in a new world. Let's try and sort it out. And we did. Today in the Middle East, from the Arab Peace Initiative onwards, the fact is we do actually have a consensus and desire within the region to reach that two-state solution. Not in every part of that region, not even in every part of every country in that region. But the Arab Peace Initiative that was launched by the then Crown Prince Abdullah in 2002, the commitment to that still remains. And that does give us our context in which we can reach peace. Because when President Obama, at the very outset of his time as president, said that reaching peace is a strategic interest of America. He said something very, very important indeed. He said that from now on, this is an issue that isn't just about peacemaking in the interests of Israelis or Palestinians. It's a strategic interest for the whole of the world. I believe that it is. I believe that however difficult it is, we can never afford to give up. And I also believe, despite all the pessimism that might be justified given the present impasse. It is worth us continuing. It is worth us never yielding the ground to those rejectionists who do not want peace. And it is worth carrying on until finally we get the deal done. Thank you.